this video I have a look at an AIS unit I managed to pick up for a good price on eBay and tell you everything I found out about it and the pros and cons and the cheapest way to get AIS into your Navionics app. <coughs> well, I wanted to tell you about the AIS unit that I managed to make up because it's not just an ANS unit, there's a number of components required for this and the primary component I suppose is the iPad you need to be on this Navionics app, I'll just get it <clears throat> uh, I'll just subscribe to Navionics and so I don't know if you can see here. Um, <clears throat> and so we've now got all his Douglas and we can see um, the information that we need to see about it. Tides and so on. Um, yeah. I won't go into how you use this, but there's a Apparently there's a way to connect this to an AIS unit so that you also see ships on here within your range. And so it actually achieves this using Wi-Fi. I think you can also plug it into the USB port, but that's a bit, you know, a bit beyond me that because with Apple stuff you can pay a lot for the, those kind of con components, connectors, accessories. Yeah. And so what I've done is I managed to pick up this, these components here and I got two of these. I'll tell you what, this is an antenna and <clears throat> I found that antennas, I need a new antenna for my VHS and the price of antennas is really expensive. You know, there's no antenna I've seen that's less than 61 pounds and so I managed to buy two of these because I only wanted a short one. I managed to buy two of these. I think they're about about ten pounds each, maybe less. And they have a, spe a certain fitting. This one here, I had to buy a BNC connector converter to this. I could have put it on a cable, but I thought it might be okay to do it like this. It might be a bit to be careful with this, it's got to be mounted internally into the steering pinnacle. And so once it's in there and padded up, it should be okay. Yeah. And so they're a fairly complicated device if you don't know much about electronics, because what they are is they transmit Wi-Fi. This is a Wi-Fi antenna here, and they're picking up GPS. This is a GPS antenna. Now, this came with a GPS antenna second hand. I was lucky to pick it up for about £50. They're about 150 new and probably the antenna is a separate component to it. Probably doesn't come with it. And, and so I've got the whole unit really it's cost me oh and it has the other bits. It needs a switch to switch it off and on because it's consuming power of course and a fuse, some wiring, and so the whole lot's about 60, 65 pounds, something like that. So that's really good, and I don't need an, a VHF aerial or antenna splitter having two separate antennas, one for the VHF, one for the AIS. If you have a splitter, I think the splitters are about 130 pounds, it's ridiculous, and so I thought to have two separate cheap antennas. Now, the only place you can get these antennas is from China. So I ordered two of them direct from China and they took about 10 days to get it probably. So that was pretty good really. I'll just show you the other part. I had to order, as well as a BNC connector, I had to order a VHF 
cable or cable and that. I'm going to mount two of these, probably mount them both on the binnacle. And uh, oh, this has got one goes in this way. You could actually drill a hole and just put a blob of, of you know, the stuff, that black stuff on there and take that through and plug that into your VHF. And so I don't know where it's going to work, but the specifications on this are as good as a normal antenna. It's only the height above sea level that is any different from a normal yacht's VHF aerial. So it'll be interesting to see how they work or if they work at all. But they're supposed to be in the correct, they're supposed to do the job. I think they're sold for cars, something like this. Car VHF or truck VHF. I don't know. But I can't afford to pay £130 for an antenna splitter and £61 for an antenna with us meet with 200 pounds already before we even started so you see how being a little bit cautious about what we buy and a little bit i'll say we use the word intelligent about it we may be able to find economical ways that we can get into this area because it's necessary to be able to see these boats coming at you in the middle of the night if you find yourself having to do a passage in the fog or something like that and you really want to know whether there's a big ship anywhere near you. And this is going to tell you, it's not going to tell you if there's a ship 20 miles away, but it'll tell you if there's a ship 2 miles away, and probably further. But we'll find out, and I'll report in my videos how well it works. And then you'll know, from my experience, whether it's worth saving money like this. If it doesn't work that well, all I've got to do is bite the bullet and buy better aerial, two aerials, I don't know, I think it's going to work, <laughs> most things do, so that's a little bit of an update, and then in the, in the Navionics app you simply have to select the Wi-Fi, connect to this on Wi-Fi, and you should then have, your ships should then appear on there, and you have your alarms that you can set, so on, so that it can wake you up. If there's a ship close by, it appears on your AIS unit. So I'm going to be taking it up to Scotland and it's going to be helping me hopefully on my trip down to Port Pendant from Oh, I keep on forgetting. But it's up there in yeah, Scotland. Here's my itinerary. It's uh Ardfern via Giga. The island of Giga, Rathlin, Loch Ryan, Douglas on the Isle of Man, and then Port Penryn, with options to divert to Strangford in Ireland, Drummore in the UK, uh, or Holyhead. Either of those three, if the wind is not favourable, or conditions need me to take shelter. Okay. The solar panel also came today and it's slightly different. I'll just show you that too. bigger than you remember them to be. I, I'm so happy with Renergy Re and its packaging and everything that I would never ever, since my experience with Renergy is so good, I would never ever buy any other so brand of solar panel. And one criticism I had of previous Renergy or my old Renergy panel was 
is that the corners are a bit sharp and I don't know if we can get this out but I'll just pull this corner off here if we can see look at this now it's got this rounded I don't know if that's in the photo got this rounded blue rounded corners exactly the same color as my boat so that's a bit of a bonus and like I say I already tried these I plugged them in to my unit they just plug straight into these cables here and it all works. Started to float charge my battery in here, and it, and this can connect with these to a bigger battery or a battery bank, and so it's an instant solar panel setup. So I'm just going to take this equipment with me, just put it on the boat. I've got some. I'm going to bolt this to the boat to the back rail. So I've got a bit of equipment still coming. To be able to bolt that but that's all it is really a battery this a, a bigger battery and the panel and we have a portable solar panel array to get us down here sunday it's not very far away it's now tuesday we're well on our way well, we're doing some testing here of the AIS system and I've got it just connected to this battery over here and you can see my switch is lit up to show that the AIS unit's on and that's good because I just found out that the transmitter if you have two AIS aerials, you see there's a the AIS, the VHF aerial there for the AIS and if you have two of these it's important that you don't put the aerials right next to each other because you can actually send a lot of power directly into this unit here and damage it and so that's the only problem really and so if you're using your VHF it's useful to actually just switch this thing off so that it doesn't actually receive anything whilst you're using transmitting on the VHF. Otherwise you have to separate these things apparently vertically, one meter vertically and two meters horizontally. Okay, so that's some useful information there. But the only damage that can happen is if you're transmitting and so, you know, the short amount of time that you use it for transmitting, just turn it off really. Because you're already at that point, you know where the ships are. If you're talking to them, you're looking at them. So that should be a reasonable way of doing it. Now, if you're going to turn it off, you're going to lose the connection probably. And so that's something that I'll be reporting back on. The interesting thing is, is we've got, normally I would have this connected through the Wi-Fi to this which is my internet access. Of course if you're sailing away from internet access which is normal situation you're not going to need the internet access anyway and so it's possible at that point just to have it connected here and if you look at this here you can see it's connected to the Quark QK A027 here and for me to reconnect it to this one I'll have to probably turn it off we'll just try this turn it on again and then we've got Adam's iPhone there and now we're connected to the internet no longer connected to that over there Okay, so there's a bit of messing around here, but it's more complicated if you're going to have it connected to both of these devices. I would say 
I'm not going to bother. It's too complicated. You're out at sea, you don't want to be messing around with something complicated. So this is easier just to change which one you connect it to, you know, and you can connect each one separate then to each one. So you could have this connected to that and another phone connected to that or whatever. Yeah, you get the idea, depending on what you're doing. So I hope that helps understand these things. I've been monitoring these batteries. I have a battery charger here and I've been learning quite a bit about chargers and charging batteries and so on. This is a traditional charger that actually um, will just charge no matter what battery is connected to it. So it's kind of useful to have, uh, apparently if the battery is in bad condition or too low voltage some of these other automatic chargers won't actually do anything they just won't switch on so it's useful to be able to switch this on and monitor what's going on you can see the sort of condition of the battery by what happens on the amp ammeter here apparently if it goes down to three amps then it's fully charged and you don't want to charge it beyond that point okay so we're all ready now we know that the thing works we know that we can connect to it so we should have the minimal amount of problems when we get up to Scotland try and use this you can see we've got flashing LEDs here and I did download the manual there's actually three LEDs you can see there's a a, a a green one flashing at the bottom there and there's one in the middle that flashes only when it gets a signal from the a ship another ship and so that has of course there's no ships in Bromia so <laughs> I can't really test it I don't really know what's whether it's working or not but we'll find out when we get near some shipping okay mm -hmm.